So I've alluded to the topic of today's lecture quite a bit already in earlier lectures. Um, this is quite natural as well because we're doing both these parts of the course where one part is focusing on deep learning and the other part is focusing on reinforcement learning. But on the other hand, maybe um, before the course you would have expected a maybe more tight uh, integration of these two. But turns out there's a lot to be said about reinforcement learning without even talking about how to approximate the functions. So that's what we've been doing so far. We've been talking about how to do these things, maybe even when you do them tabularly. And the assignments also reflect that, where um, you haven't been doing much TensorFlow or deep learning in terms of the uh, reinforcement learning assignment. But of course, um, many of you will know and have known before this course started that there is such a thing as deep reinforcement learning. And today I'll touch upon what that means, what that um, means as a term, but also what it means in practice. Um, more generally, we'll talk about function approximation, which is the term that R Rich also uses in the, uh, Rich and Andy, in the, in the Sutton and Barto book. More generally to talk about approximating functions. So again, just to recap quickly, this is the setting, reinforcement learning. And agents can learn a policy, a value function, or a model. And we'll focus on that, um, how to learn, and especially the value function this lecture. Um, and in general, we're, we're interested in the general problem, including con consequences, time, and how to deal with that. But specifically, um, I now want to highlight the fact that all of these things are functions. I did that in the first lecture as well. But I want to re-highlight that again. So each, each of these, a policy, a value function, or a model, is basically a mapping from, for instance, for the value function from a state to a value or a state action pair in the case of action values to a value. In the case of a model, it's a mapping from a state to, for instance, a next state or maybe an expected next state. And in the case of a policy, it's a mapping from states to actions. Now, what we want to do essentially is learn these from experience. And if there are too many states, which is often the case, we will need to approximate. And in general, this is called reinforcement learning with function approximation, which is a bit of a long term. But when you use deep neural nets, people typically refer to this as deep reinforcement learning, to just basically merge the terms deep learning and, and reinforcement learning. Now, this term is fairly new. It came to prominence basically a few years ago. Um, but the idea of combining neural networks with reinforcement learning is actually quite old, decades old. Um, we've just gotten maybe better at it. And of course, in addition, we have the same benefits that deep learning um, has exploited quite successfully in the, in the recent years, which is the fact that we not only, do, not only do we understand the methods better, we also now have the compute resources to train these things for fairly long amounts of time with fairly large amounts of data. And it turns out if you do that, then certain things just work that we're not sure, we were not sure would work, say, in the 90s or earlier. That said, many of the algorithms, the base algorithms that we use, are essentially that old. Um, Q-learning, for instance, is from uh, 1989 uh, by Chris Watkins. And it, has, it basically was immediately extended to also uh, be used with neural networks. But that doesn't mean that we really understood what was going on back then. I say we, but I wasn't researching back then. But um, we as a field, that, that we really understood what was going on back then, or um, that we were very effective at it. But it did work um, if you were a little bit careful, if you were a little bit aware of the properties of the function approximator of the neural network in that case. But I'll basically, first I'll step up a, bit, a, bit, a little bit and not go immediately into the deep nets. Um, and just to be clear, for this lecture, I'll be talking about learning value functions. In the next lecture, I'll talk about uh, learning policies explicitly. So we'll return to policy gradients, which got covered in the uh, lecture on exploration and exploitation, when we were discussing the single state immediate reward case. And next lecture, I'll talk, talk about policy gradients in the deep reinforcement learning case, where we were covering the full sequential problem. And in addition, we're covering the case where we have arbitrary nonlinear function approximation. Um, but for this lecture, we'll stick to the value functions just for clarity mostly. Now, the motivation is quite clear. We want to use reinforcement learning, and it turns out we can use reinforcement learning to solve large problems. One of the earlier examples was backgammon. This is something that Jerry Tassaro did, where he basically used TD learning with a neural network. And then um, 
use this in the game of backgammon, which is a tricky game, but turns out actually not that tricky for reinforcement learning, because you, you can play many of these things against yourself, essentially. Um, because the rules of the games are fairly well defined, so you know exactly, you can, you can program, them, program that in, into a computer, you can have an agent play against itself, and you, it can learn to become better. And of course, more recently, this was applied, um, this methodology, not the exact algorithm, but the methodology of applying reinforcement learning was applied to Go, which is much, much bigger than Backgammon. And you could never hope to learn this if you were going to try to store every value that you could possibly uh, find for every state individually. Um, in addition, there are some problems which are maybe easier thought of as having an infinite continuous space. So an example here is, uh, is a helicopter. Um, helicopter control was done um, several years ago, as, go, several years ago as well, and there's many similar control problems that have been tackled with reinforcement learning. And here, the state space is basically infinite, although it's bounded typically. And then again, the problem is to find a mapping from that state space to either a policy or a value function. And of course, again, it's good to keep in mind this um, example of the robot. Just whenever you think about reinforcement learning, I find it quite helpful when I think about algorithms or whatnot to think about the case, would this learn or would this be able to learn at all when it would be embodied on a robot, right? If this robot has a limited brain and it needs to do some approximation because it has a limited view of the world, but the world is big, then somehow you need to be able to cover that case. So the main question here is how can we scale up our methods for prediction and control? And to recap, not fully, but we've mostly considered lookup tables so far. At points I've pointed towards, hey, this equation is for the lookup table, but you can then extend it to the uh, function approximation case by just replacing from some stuff. But we haven't really gone into depth of what that means or how that would work. And obviously, whenever we can apply this to a state value, you can typically also apply this to a state action value. So I'll be trading these, these cases more or less uh, indifferently. Now, there's a few problems with uh, large MDPs that we, it's good to be explicit about that we want to tackle. So the one is quite obviously that if there are so many states, you cannot even fit it in memory in a computer. You cannot build a table that is that big to cover all the states in a game like Go, for instance. Um, in, like in a typical big, so especially the robots are a clear example. If the robot is in the real world, you might want to put the universe on the machine, but that doesn't fit. So you need to do something else there. Um, additionally, and sometimes even more importantly, um, it's too slow to try to learn the value for each state individually. And this is essentially the problem of generalization. Whenever we see a state, we want to learn about that state, but we also want to learn about all the similar states, because if it's a really big problem, you're never going to see the exact same state twice. So that means that if you would learn about each state individually, you would never learn anything, um, or you would never learn anything that you can use in the later states, because they will all look like brand new states. So obviously we want to generalize. Um, this will come as no surprise. And another thing that often pops up, and I'll come back to, is that individual states are often not fully observable. Again, it's useful to think of a robot, which maybe has a camera to view the world, and it only sees whatever it sees through its camera, but it can't look through walls, it can't look maybe behind itself. The sensors are in that sense limited, and you want to somehow deal with that. So the solution that we're proposing here is just to estimate these things with some function. And notation that I'll be using, as I did before, is that there's some uh, theta parameter. Um, I should say here that the book these days uses w for the parameters for the value functions, um, just to prevent confusion. But it doesn't really matter. It's just a name, variable name for the parameters. And you can think of this as all the weights of your neural network. And the idea is, for instance, to in a prediction case, to approximate the true uh, value of a policy. This also immediately kind of um, points towards a means to do control, because as you may remember, we've discussed policy iteration at some point. And generalized policy iteration means you first estimate the value of your current policy, and then you improve that policy. And you don't have to fully improve it. You can just improve it a little bit. And then you could do the estimation again and the improvement. And you can interleave these steps quite fine-grainedly. That's generalized policy uh, iteration, which as an intermediate step has this step of approximating the value of a policy. So if we can approximate the values of a policy, this already gives us a way to do control. 
Um, of course, we can also immediately try to estimate the optimal values, which is on the right there. You could or V star or Q star, which essentially means we can do SARSA or we can do Q learning. We could do the on policy thing of learning about the current policy, or we could try immediately to learn about the greedy policy, which basically means we're interleaving the steps of uh, policy evaluation and improvement very fine. On each step, we're kind of doing both at the same time. Now, the hope is if we have such a function, if it's a well-defined function on the full state space, we can plug in any state, and we can get an answer immediately. And if your learning algorithm is um, well-designed in some sense, and if your function isn't too weird, you'll probably get a reasonable answer if the state looks a little bit like states you've seen before. That's the hope. Now, of course, there's many ways to do that, and I'll talk about a few of them in this lecture. And the high-level idea that we're talking about mostly here is to update these parameters, theta, using either Monte Carlo or temporal difference learning. And in the end, I'll talk about how to unify these. But the other thing that I wanted to say, which I won't touch upon that much in this lecture, but I'll get to back, back to a little bit um, also in the next lecture, is that the environment states might not be fully observable. As I mentioned, the robot example, when you just have your vision from the camera, which means you might want to learn a state update function. And the state of the function, just to remind you, is something that takes the previous agent state and the current observation, and it outputs a new agent state. So now I'm using S here to, do, to refer to the agent state, which is essentially the state internal to the agent, which might not coincide with the environment state, which might be much, much bigger. So in the slides that will come, mostly I won't talk about this too much. And one way to think about this is that whenever you see a state, you could just think about the observation, which is a simple way to construct an agent state. You just take your observation, you just ignore the previous agent state, and you're done. Right? This is an agent state. But if you only look at that, your um, potential solution might be limited. The robot can only ever do, can learn a, only ever learn a function that is a direct function from its observations, which might not always lead you to the optimal policy. So I just want you to keep this in mind. You can maybe forget about it for most of the lecture, but whenever you then want to apply something like this in the real world, and I will get back to this again, um, this is something that is, a, that is potentially important. OK, now you might think I might immediately go and talk about deep neural networks now as plugging those in, but there's actually many potential choices that I do want to mention. So the obvious first curse, uh, choice here is uh, to put an artificial neural network as a function approximator. Um, alternatively, one thing that has been done in the past is to put a decision tree in there, which has maybe somewhat harder boundaries in terms of generalization. Um, but they're fairly well understood, and you can use them effectively if, you, uh, if your problem is well suited for them. You could also do something non-parametric, nearest neighbor. Just store a few samples, find the nearest one, use that one. And this is actually something that is sometimes pops back up again, that people reinvestigate, and it turns out it works quite well in certain problems. Or you construct certain features. I'll touch upon that more. So here it says Fourier wavelet basis. That's one potential choice. There's many ways you can construct features. Coarse coding is essentially a different way to construct features. Don't worry if you don't know what any of these two mean. Um, I'll talk more about especially the coarse coding in a moment. But just think of it as a way to construct features which you then later use um, to maybe do a simple linear function rather than to try to learn a whole deep neural network. And these were very popular in the past, also because they're quite computationally efficient. And they tend to be quite data efficient, because it's easier to learn a linear function than it is to learn a deep uh, neural network. Of course, you're limited in the type of functions you can learn. You need very good features if all you're ever going to do with it is construct a linear function of your features. Now, in principle, in terms of the generic updates, you can use any function approximation. Um, but of course, reinforcement learning has some specific properties, which might make it harder. Um, there are some listed here. This is not meant to be an exhaustive list. But one important difference with the standard supervised case um, is that the experience is not IID. Typically, successive time steps, and therefore successive updates, if you update your uh, value function online, will be correlated, which may or may not be a problem, but it's good to be aware of. Also, as I mentioned in the first lecture and after uh, a couple of times, the agent policy affects the data it receives which affects the nature of the function you're learning. So these things are tightly uh, integrated in basically highly non-trivial ways, and the learning dynamics of the full system is something that is not that well understood. And as a related note, the value functions can be non-stationary. 
Now the policy iteration case is a very clear example of that. There we're not plugging in one specific policy, but we're going to change the policy repeatedly because we want to find something that works really well. Which means each time we're kind of trying to estimate a different value function. <coughs> but it turns out, depending on your learning algorithm, the value function might be non-stationary or the targets that you're trying to uh, uh, approximate can be non-stationary for other reasons. For instance, when you're doing bootstrapping, as in TD learning. Because then, um, I'll show you the, the examples later again on later slides, but just to remind you, what does that mean, TD learning? It means that you're updating the value of a state towards the um, reward and then the value at the next state added together. But the value at the next state itself is part of the function that you're updating, which means that in total your update is non-stationary, which may cause problems for certain types of function approximation. Or it may invalidate certain algorithms that might assume that this is not the case. And it might actually break them in practice as well. Another uh, property of reinforcement learning is that feedback is delayed, which means especially in the online case you might do something, you might immediately update using say TD learning, but it's not always clear that this is the best thing to do. Sometimes you want to wait a few updates, as in Monte Carlo learning, but then this it creates overhead, you need to do the bookkeeping if you, if you program this, and it's not always trivial to do this, although that, that part might be easier than some of the others. So here's some, some potential choices, like generic choices, I would say, for a function approximation. Uh, we started off with a table, right? Just store for every state that you could possibly see, just think of every observation that you could possibly see, store it as an exact uh, value in a table somewhere, which you can then update. Maybe you still update it only slightly for each observation, because maybe, sorry, for each transition, because maybe your data is noisy, as we discussed in earlier lectures. But this is a fairly well understood thing. Now an easy thing you can do, especially when you consider, say, continuous spaces which are still not that high dimensional, you could think of just cutting this up. So if you think about your state space as being, for instance, a two-dimensional space, it's just a plane and it's bounded, well one thing you could do is you could just cut that up into pieces and then call each of these pieces a state. That's a valid thing to do and then you're basically back to the tabular version, right? We've just manually created something that is essentially a tabular MDP. However, one thing that you should note then is that we've actually aggregated states together, which means you might not be able to observe exactly in which state you are. So you've made the problem partially observable when you do that. Slightly more generically, or sorry, slightly more generally, you could do linear function approximation. This basically subsumes both the tabular and the state aggregation case, where we say we have some features, the cutting up of the state space was one example, but you could think of many other features that you could construct. Um, and then we hope that we can learn a, a function that is accurate enough as a linear combination of these features. <coughs> the benefit of this is that it's very well understood. And we can say much more about where does the, do the algorithms go when you run them for a long time? Do they converge? And if so, where do they converge? Um, it also tends to learn faster than if you do arbitrary nonlinear function approximation. But of course, it's very much dependent on the, f on the nature of the features. And it might be very tricky for a certain problem to define good features. But if you can, this is definitely something that you could consider. And the most general case, and one that we happen to like a lot these days, is to use um, differentiable nonlinear functions, such as neural networks. The benefit of this is that we can just toss a raw signal in, like pixels from a camera, and you can still hope to learn. And that is a big benefit because you no longer have to create features, you no longer have to actually understand your problem that well. For instance, on these Atari games, I've run algorithms on, on Atari games which I don't even understand, I've never played. I don't know how to play. Like, the algorithms will be much better at these games than I am. And I can do that because I don't need to understand the game, which is quite a nice benefit. So which should you use? Um, I assume most of you will be tempted to use the deep neural networks which is fine, and they tend to give you best performance these days, depending on the setup. But just to point that out, this list up there, basically from the top to the bottom, starts off with things that we understand really well, but might have a little bit more weak performance. Uh, and then they go to things that we know work well, because, because we've seen it in practice, but we can't really say much with confidence about in, the, in, in, in the theory. So we can't necessarily guarantee you that it will work well, it just happens to be the case that we know when we actually run this and you're a little bit careful with how you do this that you can make them work really well. By the way, as always, feel free to stop me whenever when you have a question. <laughs>
because you're likely not to be the only one with that question. Okay. So this is just this is very generic recap. This might be a little bit boring even, considering you've seen all this stuff in the other part of the course as well. But just to be clear, we're going to define some differentiable function denoted here j. Just think of this as a loss, uh, which is a function of your parameters. And then we're going to take its gradient, which is just a vector with all the partial derivatives. And then the goal is to say find a minimum, if you think of this as a loss. Actually, in the policy gradient case, we might define things that we want to optimize, find the maximum rather than the minimum. But of course, that's easy to do just by putting a, a minus sign in front. But generically, we want to uh, move the parameters in the direction of the uh, negative gradient to do gradient descent. And this gives you one valid way to update. Of course, there's other optimizers, but this is a good one to keep in mind. And most of the concrete uh, algorithms I'll give in this lecture, I'll give you the stochastic gradient descent version. So actually, maybe let me go to the next slide, which gives the stochastic gradient descent um, for value functions. That doesn't mean that, of course, you can only use that. You can apply different optimizers. You can apply RMS prop, Adam, things you might, uh, you, other optimizers you might have heard of um, from deep learning. Essentially, anything that you can toss a gradient into and that results into an update, you can apply to the deep reinforcement learning case. But for clarity, I will only t uh, basically show you the um, vanilla stochastic gradient descent versions of the update. So then, to apply these two value functions, we define some expectation. And this is actually important now, something to touch upon a little bit. So I subscripted this uh, expectation with pi, which is the current policy. And the thing that is random in this expectation is actually the state. Because note that we've put the true value of that state on the left, and then the current estimate of that state, <coughs> v theta on the right, and then there's a squared error. Um, but the only thing that's random there is the state. So what, what I mean with the expectation under the policy of this thing is I mean there's some distribution over states, which in this case is the thing that is induced by the policy that you're following. So this is, a, is an on-policy uh, uh, loss function, essentially. And this is important when we do function approximation because we have to somehow decide where to spend our resources. Where you're going to fit a function, it's going to fit basically uh, the best it possibly can where you have the most data. So this ties into the question of how do you then select your data, which is important for the control problem. And if you pick a certain policy that never goes to a certain portion of your state space, um, you'll only get a little bit of function approximation resources allocated there, and your generalization there might not be that good. V theta? Yes, sir, good question. V theta is basically our current estimate with any function approximation of the um, v pi in this case. Uh, so this loss is when you do the on policy, policy evaluation case. Um, I use v theta just generically as this is some value function which is parameterized by theta. One way to think about that is to, it, it could be, for instance, a, a neural network, which takes the agent state as input, which could just be your observation. And then the output is the current estimate for the value of that state under the policy. Yeah. And we can just kind of, that error will map onto the TD error or the, uh, the Markov error that we, when we're doing those updates in those settings. So I'll give you the actual, I'll give you the TD algorithm in a, in a moment. Uh, so then you can see exactly what the TD algorithm in this case is. Um, so I should have prefaced this by saying this is again me basically just first defining things because this loss is not something that is actually available. You will not have access to VPI particularly. So we need somehow to instantiate this, to turn this into an algorithm that we can actually run. And I'll do that in a moment. Um, this is first just basically defining what would be an ideal update if you want to do stochastic gradient descent to learn this value function. Yeah. Just to confirm, when you set the random variable here as state, yeah. so is that because the policy, so the policy is rather in terms of what state is going to end up? Right, so the question is why, uh, so the, the random variable, the, I said the only random variable is the state. And the reason that is the case is because I've actually used the true value for that state. So I'm not rolling out anything. To, I don't have a Monte Carlo return there in particular. I will have in a later slide because you have to instantiate this. And then that will also be random. In this particular formulation, the only thing that's random is the state because I'm using, I'm plugging in the true value function. Yeah. 
which of course is something you can't do in practice, but it's just for, the, uh, for defining the loss essentially. Um, and then of course we can derive a stochastic, uh, sorry, a stochastic gradient descent update, which is on, on the bottom there. I use this delta theta notation here, um, which basically means this is the thing that I'm going to add to theta, to the parameters. Instead of each time writing the next theta is the previous theta plus something, I'll just only write that, la that latter thing, the thing that we're uh, going to add. Which in this case is just a step size times um, the sampled gradient of the loss that we defined. Now in this case, um, this sampled gradient as it is given on this slide is still not something that is available because although we've instantiated the state, I still haven't instantiated the true value, which we don't have. Um, I'll return to this in a, in, in a later slide where I'll instantiate it with both TD learning and with Monte Carlo learning. But this is just first talking about what the goal is. And to make it concrete, we can talk about a specific function which is much easier to show explicitly. Um, which will be a linear function of some features. There's a question? Yeah, sorry, just on the previous slide, yeah. so you, you're assuming that your policy is fixed and it doesn't depend on your value estimation in any way. Yeah, so the question is, do we assume, what do we assume here about the policy? We're indeed assuming that it's fixed, uh, as you say. Um, so this is the policy evaluation case. So this doesn't cover policy iteration, doesn't cover control. This is just one thing you might do, and it might not be the only thing you want to do or it might not be enough for what you want to do. If you want to do control, this is not enough by itself. It's a good question, thanks. So the, uh, yeah. the theta, is this the parameter for the um, policy or the value? Oh, sorry, it's a very good question. So theta, is, this the, is um, the parameters of the policy um, are not given here. So the policy is fixed. We're, we're assuming it's basically something that might not, might not even be under your control. There's just some sequence of mapping from states to actions. Theta here refers only to the parameters of the value function, so only to that mapping from the state to the uh, value. Later on, and especially in the next lecture, I'll talk about param parametric policies, where you also have a function with its own parameters that will output an action, and then these parameters we somehow have to think about how to update. But I'll defer that to the next lecture. Good question, thanks. Okay. So to make this concrete, let's instantiate a function. Let's pick a simple one, a linear function. To do that first, we have to define some features, because typically we don't want to do a linear function of, say, the pixels that come in. So in this case, there's just some mapping from the states to some features. And one, there's a few examples here on the slide. For instance, if, you're, if, you, if you have a robot, it, this could be the distance from certain landmarks. Let's say you sprinkle landmarks all across some uh, map. And then this could just be a vector with all the numbers that correspond to the distances from all these landmarks. And if you have enough of these landmarks, you can basically uh, exactly determine where the robot is from these features. And you could maybe hope to have some predictions that also are linear functions of these features. It really depends on what your prediction is, though. It really depends on the reward signal, whether that's enough, whether those features are rich enough in that sense. Um, there's some other examples, things that have been done in the past, such as configuring somehow, uh, picking out piece and pawn configurations in chess, rather than trying to map each configuration to a specific state value, to a specific cell in a table. You could basically aggregate many of them together and say, oh, if, it, if your pawns are roughly like this, this feature will be on, it will be equal to one. And if they're not like that, it will be off, it will be equal to zero. Oftentimes, these features are um, binary, they don't have to be. The distances, for instance, aren't binary, but um, many people have done things in the past where they've basically defined binary f features which give you indicators of whether certain things are true or not. And then your, your weighted sum of these things is just uh, your estimate of the value. Um, is this how do you do chess AI? So I think uh, a lot of uh, chess AI, I'm not actually that familiar with what was done in uh, chess AI, but I believe most of it was actually uh, based more on search and heuristic search. And there was very little um, reinforcement learning applied to chess. Um, so these days you can right, apply reinforcement learning to chess, obviously. 
Um, but it turns out, especially in these type of problems, it's actually quite easy to leverage a lot of human knowledge. If you have a lot of human knowledge, it's much easier to construct features that are quite informative. But you could also immediately construct evaluation functions. Like, oh, if you have this many pawns and this many pieces, then you should be better off than the other one who, who has fewer. And then you could just search through a big space, do a smart search so you don't search everywhere, and then you could just use these evaluations directly so you don't have to construct uh, features and then learn a value off of that. You can combine these things. You can learn these uh, evaluations. Okay. So now the value function has a fairly simple form. The um, theta, the parameters of our value function, is now just also a uh, vector with the same size or the same number of elements as our features. So we have a number per feature. And I already said this a number, a, a number of times on the previous slide, but essentially a value function will just be a weighted sum of the features. So we're multiplying each of these features, these phi j at state s, with the corresponding number theta j, which is just a real number, and this will then constitute our value function. This is just a simple function in some sense, and this actually helps understand it better as well. So I'll talk about this function quite a bit in this lecture. And of course our loss function that we had before, we can now instantiate by just replacing the v theta, the more generic way of writing it down, with this specific choice, where we multiply this uh, theta vector with the feature vector. The thetas are global, they're shared across all states because we're learning this one weight vector that should, should define our whole function. And then the features depend on the state. Now, if we, would, if we would have labels, if we would have these true values at each state, then this would just amount to regression, linear regression. And we could find the global optimum, which means we could find the least square solution. And the update rule for uh, the stochastic gradient descent case is very simple. Um, what I'll do on this slide and later often is I'll, whenever I take the feature of the state at st, just to reduce the notation a little bit, I'll just say features t. So there's just a phi with the subscript t, which is the features you see at that point in time. So that means we don't have to reason about states, there's just uh, a lot of features coming at you and rewards coming at you, and this is what your algorithm is then based on. The update is very simple. It's a step size times the prediction error, where again, I'm still using the true value there. Um, so this is the difference between the true value and your current estimates, times the feature vector. In the case of linear functions, because it just happens to be the case that the gradient of a linear function with respect <coughs> to your parameter is just only the feature vector. That's not the case for deep neural networks or more generally for linear of, or for nonlinear function approximation. A special case of this is we can still do tabular using this exact same formulation by considering a feature vector that's basically one hot, which means that exactly one of the values is uh, one at each time, and it, all the other values are zero of our feature vector. And then we just make sure that we have one such feature for every state, which means that the linear function approximation case that I just showed you basically generalizes the tabular case. Of course, this also immediately shows the problem with the tabular case because there will be many, many states in those, uh, uh, in those cases when you have a large problem that you want to solve, which means that this is a very large vector potentially. So this is just basically to show you that these things are the same in some sense, or that the linear one generalizes the tabular one. Now to give a concrete example for how could you potentially build features, this is a very simple example um, called coarse coding. And the idea is quite simple that you have, uh, you overlay over, let's say you have a two dimensional space. Over that two dimensional space, you overlay some um, basically location indicators. And in this case, there's not a single feature that will turn on. It doesn't say, oh, what is the nearest thing, but it will actually say, when you're near certain locations, the features will be on for those locations. Which means you can actually, in this case, there might be three features on because we're near enough three of these uh, centers of these circles. Um, which means that the combination of these three features actually tells you fairly precisely where you are. 
And then we could use that um, as a feature representation just to do the, the, the weighted sum. And things like this have been tried quite a bit in the past, and it tends to be quite um, effective. But it's also quite easy to, to, to consider failure mode. So when would this fail? Well, one clear way when it would fail is when um, you have a very high dimensional space. If it's a continuous space, but it's not two dimensions, but it's like maybe 100 dimensions, or maybe if you think about pixels, if you have 100 by 100 pixels, that's already 10,000 dimensions, if each of these can have a real value, then maybe something like this doesn't scale that well. But for low dimensional, uh, uh, sorry, low dimensional problems with low dimensional state spaces, this might be a very appropriate way to first model it and then try if you can find a simple solution that, um, that exploits these features. There's some generalization here, which means that whenever we update any of these weights associated with the features, we basically will update the weight for the whole circle, for each of these circles. So we're not just updating the value within that small almost triangle in the middle, but in fact we will be updating the value a little bit for all of the other uh, shaded regions there as well. Because we're updating essentially, in this case, three different values corresponding to the, each of these three features. And that means that whenever we change one of these values, the whole value function within that region gets um, updated a little bit. And this is nice because it means that if you end up somewhere which is close but not exactly at the same point, you will already get a well-defined value there, which is probably fairly accurate if the true value is fairly smooth there. Of course, if there's large discontinuities, which sometimes happens, sometimes the true value really has a sharp edge somewhere, it depends how you space these things, whether you can capture that. And it could be that you generalize over that cliff, and then maybe this might cause problems with your approximation. Which is basically just another way of saying, if you have a linear function of some features, it's probably going to be not that flexible, so you might not be able to, ca uh, to capture all of the uh, rich functions that you might need to solve a certain problem. Also note, and I mentioned this before, that when we do something like this, we're actually aggregating states. So even if you only consider like the small little tri triangle in the middle on the left-hand side there, there's multiple states that fall into this triangle, potentially. You could end up in this place, near this place multiple times, but you can't actually distinguish them. If these are binary features especially, then all of them will have the exact same feature representation, all of these, all of these situations where you're near enough which means they cannot have different values. What this also means is that the problem becomes non-Markovian because the fact that you cannot tell exactly where you are means you could potentially also not exactly, not exactly determine what the next reward distribution or state distribution would be without taking into account where you were before. And this is exactly violating the defini definition of the uh, mark of decision process. And in fact, this is the common case when you do function approximation. Because we're going to generalize, we're going to want to generalize, because otherwise learning is, in, uh, is incredibly slow. But when you generalize, this does mean that you lose the Markov property a little bit, which is something to, to take into account, to be aware of, and you might want to correct for that in various ways. One way that I'll just mention here in passing, but I'll get back to in, a, in the next lecture, um, is that you might want to build up an agent state that is very rich and that has a lot of information. You might want to think about memory, for instance. Yeah? Could you just uh, clarify or explain what uh, these features might typically be? If they're not, say, spatial, how can you be near the It's a very good question. So how, what, would these, what would these features mean if you, for instance, you do have a 2D input, but it's not spatial? And essentially the answer to that is it's unclear and it might be fully inappropriate. And this is also why this slide actually shows three examples. One, like on the left, we're doing not that much generalization in some sense. The, the circles are fairly small, which means we're fairly precise. And in that case, you might still be okay because near might still be well defined. But, but maybe you want to do more general generalization as in the middle plot. But maybe it's actually more appropriate to have something that is very differently shaped. And it might be indeed fully inappropriate to generalize in such a way across your input space. So this ties back to the question of how do you define your features? And in general, you really need to understand your problem a little bit in order to even define useful features. You cannot just hope to have a one solution for all, uh, all problems in terms of feature, uh, feature definitions. It's a very good question. <coughs> 
Um, yeah, so why is it non-Markovian? Um, I guess the, the, um, the situation that's maybe clearest is if you think about, think about a robot that can be in many different rooms. And let's say we have features per room. So this is kind of like this, where we, we have like a location indicator, right? But, but I'm just making it very, uh, very um, large scale in some sense, because rooms we think of as basically fairly large things. Now, the definition of the Markov property is that you cannot um, essentially improve your, uh, well, let, me say, let me say it more clearly, the distribution of the next reward and state, so the state, state reward transition distribution, if you will, um, depends on your current state. But if you add previous states, you cannot make it, it doesn't depend on your previous states, it, given your current states. So the shorthand that we used for that was the, um, the future conditioned on the present is independent of the past. So when you have features saved per room for a robot, that's no longer the case because you might have transitioned just into that room on the previous step. And if you only look at the feature right now, which is in the room, you might be anywhere in the room. But if you would take into account that the previous feature was, I was just outside of the room in this other room, this would give you a lot more information. So the distribution of your reward might, quite, might be quite different when you add previous observations in that case. It also has very concrete consequences because it means that your value function might be a lot more accurate if you take into account a few previous observations because it's much easier to predict the actual value of being where you are, which might not be anywhere in the room, but it might actually be in the northwest corner of the room or something like that. And taking previous observations into account might allow you to um, basically know that, whereas just looking at the current observation might not. No, it's a good question. So what is the underlying dynamics is essentially the question. So you could imagine doing something where, um, where each time a robot transitions somewhere, you reset it to the center of that region, say. And then it, only c then it can transition somewhere else. In that case, it would be Markovian again. But that's not typically the case. The underlying dynamics typically use the actual location rather than the features that the robot sees. Oh, yeah, sorry, this is, just, this is not necessarily better than a grid, which is the question. In fact, most people use grids. Um, this is basically just to depict that it doesn't have to be a grid. It can be arbitrarily shaped. You could do arbitrary things here. Um, this is actually also fairly often done. Um, as, I, as I said with the example of the robot with distances, it's a little bit like that. And maybe you could have, instead of just using the distances themselves as features, you could have thresholds on the distances, and then you get exactly this. You could say, if you're within 10 meters of this locator, then it, the feature is on, and then you basically get exactly this. And this has been used as well in the past. Okay, okay so now we get back to that question that was asked before, uh, very rightfully so. So we don't actually have the true value function, which we've been using as a placeholder uh, basically up till now. So we need to construct some targets, some valid target for that. Well, one obvious choice for that is just to use the full mark of, uh, sorry, full Monte Carlo return, which actually is an unbiased estimate for that true value. We just run the policy until termination of an episode, say, and then we just take that return, which we've uh, denoted G in the past, just to remind you, GT is the reward at the next step, RT plus one, plus the discounted reward after that, plus the discounted, double discounted reward after that, and so on, all the way until termination, or indefinitely in the continuing case. So, as mentioned when we discussed differences between Monte Carlo and TD in previous lectures, I've already alluded to a problem with that, a potential problem with that, is that it could take very long before you actually have this return which is one of the reasons why you might want to prefer to do something more like TD, where we essentially do the same thing. We just replace this true value with an estimate. And in this case, that estimate is the one step reward plus the discounted approximated value at the next state. So now you can see V theta uh, showing up in more than one place. 
It is the thing that we're updating, but it's also used as to construct a target for our update. This is very similar to the tabular um, update. The only difference is now that there's this gradient there at the end. So we're basically multiplying the step size with the temporal difference error in this case, or the Monte Carlo error in the Monte Carlo case, and then multiplying that with your uh, gradients of the value function with respect to your current parameters. And this will then give you an update. Now to go a little bit more depth of the Monte Carlo version, so the return, as I said, is an unbiased noisy sample, which means we're almost exactly in the supervised case. We have something that you could call a data set, which is um, inputs states, say S0 up to ST, so, say we have data up to ST right now, and for each of these, say we have a Monte Carlo return. So let's assume we've actually, we're in a situation where we actually have that final Monte Carlo return as well. Maybe the problem terminated after uh, time step t, maybe it also terminated a couple of times before then, we don't care, but maybe this final uh, Monte Carlo return is just this one step reward, and ST is the last state you've seen. And then you can use this training data to do the normal supervised learning thing, which you've done uh, many times, I, I assume. Um, and this would be the linear case. Do you know that there first there's actually the generic case and then the linear case is given there where I've instantiated the gradient of the value function with respect to the parameters as the current feature vector, which is the case for the linear function approximation, which gives us linear Monte Carlo policy evaluation. This is just regression, right? So in the bottom case it's a linear regression, in the top case it could actually be nonlinear regression, this could still be a neural network if you want. Um, but especially for the linear case, this converges to a local optimum because it's a, uh, it's a convex loss function and stochastic gradient descent can find the minimum there. And in the general case, it'll find a local optimum. In the, sorry, the nonlinear case, it can find a local optimum. In the linear case, it can only find the global optimum because there is only one optimum. There are no local optima. But this does also work for nonlinear functions. So you could plug in a neural network. You could just do regression with that. You've, you've done that before. And this, in that sense, should just work. But we might want to do TD instead, um, where we, instead of using the Monte Carlo return, we use this one-step return, and we bootstrap. So we use the one-step reward, and we use the discounted value at the next state, and we plug that in into place of the true value function, which again allows us to construct a training set. And in this case, we, construct this, we can construct this any time immediately after taking a step, because it's immediately available. We don't have to wait indefinitely until an episode ends. And then we can construct an update that looks very similar to the Monte Carlo case. And this will be um, in the, the bottom equation, it will be linear, because again, I've instantiated the, the gradient there with the current feature vector. The top, top one is more generic, where I still have the gradient symbol in there, um, which could also be applied to neural networks. And one thing I did is the notational thing here of uh, replacing the TD error with this delta, which is used often in literature, so I wanted to put it on a, on a few slides as well, so you're familiar with that notation, which means we can write the update very concisely. This is again step size, alpha, times the temporal difference error in this case, delta, times the feature, uh, phi. I didn't subscript, subscript uh, the step size here with a, uh, with a t. You could also have a time varying step size, in which case all of these would be subscripted with t. And this gives you a valid update, both of these, the Monte Carlo case and the temporal difference case. And then we can talk about where do these things go, where do they converge, especially for the linear case, this is quite easy to look at, so this is why we focus on that one a little bit. And it turns out to converge to this quantity there um, at the top, there's a small proofer on the slide, which um, is not that tricky. It's some, something you've probably seen many times before because it's essentially just the normal regression case. Um, but because we're using the return, g, we can uh, later replace that again with the true value because it's in an expectation. It's an unbiased sample. So this is normal regression, you, come, you get the normal least square solution essentially uh, that you would expect by doing stochastic gradient descent. 
And now an interesting question is, this is basically unsurprising because it's normal regression again. The question is, does TD find the same solution? And it turns out it does not. The solution is slightly different. And the reason is essentially um, the fact that we can't reduce this thing, this error, all the way to zero. And then the question is, so where should you allocate your function approximation resources? And in the Monte Carlo case, this only basically depends on your state distribution. So the error there at the top that we're minimizing, the squared difference between the sampled return and the uh, estimated value at each of the states, um, this is a random quantity because of the value and the return. Um, but how well we'll estimate each state value basically depends on how often we visit them and or how often we update them. So if we assume the on policy case, I didn't actually put a pi there, so I'm not saying anything about which policy, but let's assume we're doing the on policy case where there's a, where there's a, a policy that is the same one that was used to generate the return. It's also the one that um, basically weights which states we care about. Then this will essentially weigh um, the importance of each of the states by how often you are there, and it will make your function more accurate in the states that you are often compared to states where you are less often. You cannot hope to have a function that is completely accurate everywhere, so there will be some trade-off, and depending on where you go more, the function will be better. And in the TD case, something similar happens, but in addition, there's this bootstrapping that happens. We're also updating towards a guess. So at some point, you'll stop updating because your average gradient of the loss will become zero at some point. You've reached the local optimum, but this is not necessarily at the same point as the Monte Carlo return. Which opens a question, which one should you use? So typically, the asymptotic Monte Carlo return is preferred because it's essentially the same thing as the true loss that we care about for the policy evaluation case. The return is a noisy sample for the true value, but it doesn't actually matter for the, for the convergence because in the convergence we can replace that because it's in an expectation with the true value, which means it ends up in the same place as if we would have used the true value and regressed towards that. This is not the case for TD, um, which ends up in a different place and it can be quite a bit different depending on the function approximation that you use, used, essentially because we're learning a guess from a guess, which means that the value that we're bootstrapping on might indefinitely be a little bit wrong for the same reasons that the value that we're learning with Monte Carlo is a little bit wrong. We're doing function approximation. We cannot hope to have truly accurate values everywhere. But if we're using these estimates indefinitely as in our targets, that means that we're going to estimate something that is a little bit different from the thing that we actually care about. So asymptotically, you might want to prefer the Monte Carlo solution. If you have enough time, you might just want to run that indefinitely long and you'll find the solution. However, temporal difference methods typically converge faster. They learn faster in practice, which is why you might still prefer them. Even if they don't go to exactly the place you want, they still go to a well-defined place, which is still a good solution, typically. And um, they might reach it quite a bit faster, so the trade-off there might be quite, uh, quite good. Yeah? I thought that they, in the, in the exact tabular case, yeah. they're still converging to different places because one is uh, oh. TD is doing the likelihood and MC's the uh, unbiased. Yeah, sorry, I should, I should clarify that. It's a very good question. Um, so previously I discussed something where I showed that TD found indeed basically the solution to assuming there's a Markov model and then solving that, whereas Monte Carlo found the solution for uh, basically the regression solution, um, which are different. That was in the batch case, where you basically learn indefinitely on finite data. So the Monte Carlo, so, sorry, the, the Markov problem that TD solves is the one that best fits the data up to that point. And then if you run over and over on the data again, it'll basically solve for that one. In the limit, they go to the same place, in the limit of data. Right? So that example was in basically the limit of time of updates, considering fixed data. So that's indeed a little bit confusing. So thanks for helping to clarify. Um, and this does mean, this is tied to the question of what, why does TD learn faster, because it might learn something that is actually more well suited to learn quickly on, but in the limit, in this case, it actually ends up somewhere else uh, altogether, which has nothing to do with that uh, building the Markov model in some sense. It's just a different solution. <laughs>
Now, I just wanted to, there's another potential source of confusion that I want to preempt. Because um, if you're doing the bootstrapping, there's a loss that, that is dependent now on your parameters. And there's a fairly natural thing you could do there, which is just to take, it's in the middle of the slide there, to take a loss that is just your square TD error, and just to take the gradient of that. So essentially, what I've done here to, to achieve that loss, to get, get that loss, um, I have replaced the true value with the estimate that we're going to use, the reward plus discounted next state value, before I took the gradient. Previously, I first took the gradient, I still had the true value there, I got my gradient, and then I replaced that true value with something we can actually have, for instance, the one-step TD target or the Monte Carlo return. In this case, I first replace it with a target I actually have, and then I take the gradient, and it turns out that leads to a different algorithm, because if you then take the gradient, you're also going to take the gradient of the value at the next state, which is a little bit of an odd thing to do if you think about it, because what does that mean? It means we were in a certain state, st, we did a transition, we saw a reward, and we end up in a new state, and now we're going to update both of those values so that the error on this transition is lower. But that kind of violates causality, because why would you change the value of the next state, which, the semantics of which are about the future, to make the, the update for this state better? And indeed, it turns out this works a little bit less well in practice. This is called Bellman residuals, for historical reasons. There, um, there was a paper by Baird in which he proposes this as maybe a meaningful way to do things. The update is a little bit similar to what we saw before, but instead of having the gradient of the, uh, sorry, in the middle on the right, update, the delta theta, the update to our parameters theta, is now step size times temporal difference error, that part is the same, times the gradient of the value function at st minus the discounted value function at st plus one. This is what you would get if you define your square TD error to be the loss and you just take the gradients. And this is also why I felt it important to mention this, because it's a common mistake. I mean, this is a valid algorithm, it just happens to be typically worse than TD. Uh, but it's a mistake people often make when they implement these things, especially in uh, current day auto-differentiating software packages like TensorFlow. So what I propose to do instead is if you implement something like this, that you put the target, the reward plus discounted next state value, in a stop gradient. What that means is when you define your loss. What this means is basically you're saying this is an, a proxy for the real thing, but I don't want you to update this proxy just to make the value at this state better, because it won't actually make that value better, necessarily. In fact, you're changing the value at a different state. So it's kind of a practical point, but there's also a fundamental point here that this algorithm is actually, uh, doesn't work that well. And that was a little bit of a surprise to some people because they expect as well, you can just define this as a loss. It seems to be a valid loss. And then we have a true gradient algorithm on that loss and everything seems fine. But I think the reason for that is, as I just mentioned, that basically you're violating causality. By the way, the fixed point of these things is in many cases the same. So in the end, you'll find maybe the same solution, but it might take you longer. So, as I said, I'd now like to talk about control. And the easiest way to do that, like the smallest steps that, that we can take from what we j did just now, is just to replace the value, uh, the state value estimates with state action estimates. So we're essentially just replacing a V with a Q. And then we can do policy iteration, um, where we do the generalized policy iteration, where we don't consider fully uh, evaluating policy and we don't consider maybe fully improving the policy. So for instance, one thing we could do uh, is we could approximate um, the action value function for the current policy with a parametric function g, uh, f sorry, q theta. And then maybe we will just follow an epsilon greedy uh, policy, which is um, a form of policy improvement. Of course, there's a difference here from the previous case because we're not actually guaranteed if we do these approximations with functions um, that might 
um, depend a lot on how you sample and where you sample and there's noise and in addition there's function approximation error, you're not actually guaranteed that your value function has monotonically increased, or mo sorry, monotonically improved during an evaluation step. That's kind of okay. If in general it improves, you're still good. But it's, uh, it does mean that some theoretical results get invalidated by just doing function approximation in this case. But we could still apply the method, and in many cases it's still completely valid. Which in practice means, for instance, we could do the linear function again for clarity. We could define state action features now. For instance, we could just do the same thing we did before. We could split up a state space by just discretizing it into little cells or whatnot. And then maybe we have a feature for each action, which is one way to, to do this. This is especially useful if you have a very small action space. Maybe you can only move up, down, left, right, or something like that, and you're in a two-dimensional space. Then it's fairly easy to define such features, and you could still hope to have a good function if you have a linear function of those features. This is all exactly the same as before. All I did is replace states with state action pairs and v values with q values. Now we can, we can apply this immediately for control. Um, and this is linear SARSA, which is, I, I will remind you, the uh, state action value version of temporal difference learning. So we'll bootstrap on the value of the next state and the next action as selected under your current policy. We'll use that as the value to bootstrap on to construct our target. That's SARSA. And then we just apply that with uh, a linear function, in this case using the course coding that you've seen before. And Monte Carlo is a very simple problem that often shows up in, um, in examples and in older, uh, older papers. And it's nice for various reasons. One is that it's very easy to implement, it's fast to run, and it has some nice properties. For instance, the um, state space can be considered to be continuous. And it consists of uh, a location, where is this car on the x-axis, and the velocity of the car. We're not encoding, say, the height, because it's a fixed setting. Um, so the height is actually implicitly given by the location of the car. And then the goal is to uh, accelerate your car out of this valley, essentially, and up to the goal. And the tricky thing about this domain is that you can't actually, if you just push forward, you won't reach it. What you have to do is first push back. So you climb the hill a little bit on the left-hand side, and then you push forward and you use the momentum from first going down to go up and then reach the goal. And the reason that that's interesting is because it's a, sl a slightly tricky exploration problem. Because you first have to go the wrong way in order to go the right way. Um, you just get a reward when you reach the goal. And otherwise maybe you don't, don't get any rewards. So it's also for that reason it can be a hard exploration problem. Because there's maybe sparse rewards so you don't even know what you should be doing. Um, but if you explore enough. If you have, you have only two actions basically, left and right, sometimes there's three, sometimes there's also the coast action which basically doesn't apply in any acceleration one way or the other. But you can solve this with just accelerating or uh, accelerating the other direction, which amounts to braking if you're already moving. Um, so then there would only be two actions. So if you, you, can, you can fairly exhaustively explore if there's only two actions, even if it's a tricky exploration problem. And what these figures then show is basically how the, um, the value function evolves if you do something like coarse coding in this two-dimensional space. So here the axes are the position and the velocity and then the height of this function is the value um, at that position. And this must be for one of the actions, but I don't know which one. Um, but what something interesting is happening around the later episodes, if you look at the episodes down there, 1,000 and 9,000, there's actually quite a bit of structure there. There's a ridge, there's a peak somewhere, and the reason for that is that this value function, the optimal value function, actually has something that is very, it's, it's basically discontinuity. Because if you have a certain velocity, if you're, say, close to the goal, um, you will reach the goal if you press accelerate further. But if your velocity is a little bit lower, at some point it's too low. And there's a, like a strict cutoff somewhere where your velocity can be just a little bit lower and then you might accelerate, but you won't reach it. So then the optimal policy all of a sudden is to go the other way and then go back again. Which means that there's this ridge and it shows up in the value function here. And the only reason it can show up is that the coarse coding here is not too coarse because otherwise we would be smoothing over this. 
and it might not learn to represent the value there accurately. Whether that's a problem really depends. You could have a value function that is fairly inaccurate, but it still tells you the right actions to do. Because to pick your policy, maybe only that you care about is the ordering of the action values and not having each action value to be completely accurate. That's another thing to keep in mind. Sometimes it's okay if your function is not that good, as long as it represents the right ordering of the actions, or roughly the right ordering of the actions. And if you have a smoother function, if you generalize more, you, you do have the opportunity potentially to learn faster, which is a, a benefit. Now, this has also been tried, by the way, with other ways to, uh, to uh, uh, discretize. As I said, this is, this is a, um, a well-used well toy problem that's been used by many people in many instances. And also cutting this up into rectangles or little squares rather than doing the coarse coding, all of that just works. Doing it more coarse, less coarse, it typically just works. Um, but there's very big differences in how quickly it learns and um, how robust your solution is and how optimal your solution is. If you cut it too coarse, the car won't know whether it can accelerate in a certain region or it can cannot, and it might choose to do something uh, that is maybe safer, and in some cases where it could actually reach the goal, it might actually decide to go first the other way because then it's sure that it will reach the goal if you have this very rough function approximation. In this case, it's fine-grained enough to not have to do that, but that's something also, again, in general to keep in mind. Okay. So this is another view with radial basis functions, which is pretty much the same thing as the coarse coding. And here you can see this ridge quite clearly, which is a, it's an interesting structure, the value function, not trivial, not something that I could have predicted um, immediately. Okay. So some convergence uh, considerations. So when do these incremental prediction algorithms converge? For instance, when using bootstrapping, I already said it converges somewhere else when doing the linear thing than Monte Carlo. But does it converge always? When does it converge? What are the conditions? Um, does it matter which function approximation we use? Um, does it matter whether we use function approximation? In the tabular case, we know some of these things converge. Do these results transfer? And uh, what about off-policy learning? This turns out to be an interesting and important one because that's actually quite tricky. So ideally, you want algorithms to converge in all these cases, but turns out we we kind of have them these days, but it's not that trivial to do that. And this is one of the earlier examples. The example is not the simplest one you could think of, but for historical reasons I still uh, use this one here. It's still a fairly simple MDP. And it's actually not an MDP, it's an MRP. And we're just doing prediction. We're trying to predict the value of um, this process, which is completely defined by if you're in any of those states at the top, you will deterministically go to that state at the bottom. If you're in that state at the bottom, you will go to that same state 99% of the time, and 1% of the time you will terminate, and which means you'll go back to one of those states at the top, and a new episode starts. You always start in one of the states at the top, I think, or maybe you start uniformly in all six of them. I don't think that actually matters for the, uh, for the purpose of this problem. There's a specific function defined here, which is a little bit odd. It's, like it's manually constructed to have uh, a certain property, which is why it's a little bit odd. And essentially, there are seven features here. Six states, but seven features. And in the first state uh, there at the top left, what you see there is there's something theta seven, which is the seventh feature. Um, uh, sorry, it says theta seven, which means that the seventh feature is equal to one. My value function is a weighted sum of the features. And the weights are theta 1 up to 7. But the features themselves, in this case, the seventh feature is 1, and the first feature is 2 in that state. That's what it means. That's why the value function is now defined as theta 7 plus 2 times theta 1. Just means the feature vector is 2, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0 and then a 1. I don't know whether I said the right amount of zeros there. But. Um, the second state is very similarly defined, but it has uh, a number 2 on the second element rather than the first. The seventh feature is still equal to 1. Now you don't have to fully understand why specifically this, but it turns out that if you construct your function like this, and then you construct that bottom state to have a 2 at position 7 and a 1 at position 6, then something weird happens if you update all of these states equally. So what we'll do is we'll essentially take all of these states and we'll update all of them 
using this function approximation at the same time. And then these parameters diverge. I didn't talk about rewards. There are none. They're all zero. So there's clearly a solution here, which is to put your feature vector, sorry, your, your parameter vector equal to zero. But if it doesn't start off at zero, this is a log scale, they can oscillate out of control. And this is because we're doing the bootstrapping. We're doing TD. And we're not updating the state values in proportion to how often they would be visited if you would actually follow this MDP, sorry, MRP, Markov Reward Process. Because if you would actually step through this, you would spend a whole lot more time in the bottom state than you were, would in any of the top states. And turns out if you would do that, then everything's fine. We're updating on policy, as it is called. But if you change your state distribution to be off policy, so you're predicting something else, you're predicting the value under something that you're not following right now, then turns out you can get these things. These, these things might also be out of control. Now, there's been lots of follow-up work. By the way, I encourage you to try this out if you, if you want, just to implement this. Um, it's very simple to implement. It's a simple problem. And then uh, you could try it out that these things actually do get out of control. Um, the paper by Barrett, which I'll put a resource on Moodle to point to that paper, he lists like specific initializations that you could try out and then you should be able to replicate exactly if you want to try that. Um, there are other simpler examples of this as, as well. And there's been lots of follow-up work later for people trying to fix this, trying to find algorithms that are not linear temporal difference learning, but maybe slight extensions, slight variations thereof that don't have this property, that do converge. And they do exist. There are ways to do that, to have guaranteed convergence with linear temporal difference learning. But it's already quite tricky um, to get these things right let alone if you do nonlinear function approximation. That said, this is a problem mostly, I would, I would argue, of uh, theoretical importance, because it turns out if you do linear temporal difference learning in practice, it quite often works really well. In addition, if you learn online using the current policy, this problem doesn't occur. It's only a problem because we weren't updating proportional to how often the policy would actually end up there. But it does mean this. So as I said, Monte Carlo is basically regression, which means that we know what it does roughly. And the check mark here especially, so the check mark means it converges for a certain condition. So the top row there means Monte Carlo converges when you do table lookup, when you do linear function approximation, or when you do nonlinear function approximation. The nonlinear function approximation comes, of course, with the caveat that it's only guaranteed to converge to a local optimum as typically the case when you do any nonlinear regression. Um, temporal difference learning on policy is not guaranteed to converge the vanilla version of it when you do nonlinear function approximation. That said, it typically does work well in practice. When you go off policy, and with this I mean that you update the states not proportional to how often the policy that you're trying to estimate would visit them, then we also lose the convergence property of temporal difference learning. Although, as I said, there are more advanced methods that correct for this and that they, they basically turn that one uh, cross into a check as well. Nonlinear is still kind of all bets are off. Um, so, basically, in short, Tabular control learning algorithms such as Q-learning and SARSA can be extended to function approximation. An example of that is DQN, Deep Q Network. I'll get back to that in a moment. The theory with function approximation is not fully developed, although lots, although lots of work has been done, and we understand these things way better than we did many years ago. But additionally, another thing that I wanted to call out, tracking is often prefer preferred to convergence anyway. Your problem might be non-stationary. There might be other agents in there that might be changing. There might be other reasons why you want to prefer tracking. So it's actually unclear that you even want to converge in the first place. So that's another thing to consider. However, it's very hard to reason about what is the appropriate tracking rate then, or it's, it's a little bit less well defined, which is why most theory can actually um, focuses on the convergence rather than the tracking, which is still important because what convergence tells you, even if you don't necessarily care, it also tells you what the algorithm is doing in the interim. Where is it headed, right? If you know 
say for linear temporal difference learning, we know what the fixed point is. We know what the eventual solution is that it would fi find if it was run indefinitely long. But this also means that on any step, it's roughly going in that direction. And this might be informative even if you want to track and not, not run anything to convergence. Sorry. Yeah. What, what do you mean exactly by tracking? Uh, with tracking, I mean, for instance, using a, uh, a fixed step size so that you never actually hope to converge to a single uh, uh, solution. But instead, you hope to track this, the, uh, the data that comes at you. This is uh, essentially related to the points I made about the data not being IID and not being stationary necessarily in reinforcement learning. So for instance, if your policy changes, you want to track the values rather than trying to converge to some value for the mixture of all policies that you've ever seen. You would rather learn the value for the policy that is right now. So that, that's what I mean when I say tracking. Thanks. OK. So, so far we've considered mostly online updates. Basically, go through your data and just update whenever you see something. You could also do something that is a bit more data efficient by batching things. As discussed before, where we talked about this more in a theoretical sense of, OK, let's consider like a small batch of data and train this uh, all the way until the end. Um, here I'm talking about a little bit more general. Let's say you just store the data you've seen so far, and you want to use that to be more data efficient by updating on each data point maybe more than once. <coughs> so one way to do that is to um, have an approximate value function as before. Right? Could be a poor approximation to start off with. It's just a linear function or a nonlinear function with some parameters. And we collect some data sets where I use the generic notation here v hat of pi, where this could be instantiated with the TD targets, reward plus discounted next value, or it could be instantiated with the Monte Carlo targets, whichever you want. And then the question is which parameters um, would best fit this data in a sense. And now, of course, we could just apply the same algorithm we did before but just keep on applying it to this data. Maybe we keep on uh, collecting new data, store it into the replay. Uh, sorry, this, this big batch of data in reinforcement learning uh, terminology is typically called a replay buffer because we're replaying past experiences. Um, but you could also consider um, for understanding just basically collect this data once and then keep on replaying on it and see what you would learn if you do that. Now, it turns out if you do that, if you keep on learning on this batch of data, um, you will find a least square solution, which depends on your choice of v hat. And I'll go a little bit, let's see, yes, I'll go a little bit more concretely into that. But it's important to know, so the experience replay indefinitely, like if you run that indefinitely, it's not re really that surprising. Um, this case is not specific to the linear version, but um, like the notation is not specific to the linear version, but it's easiest to think about this as converging in the linear case, where it actually finds the least square solution in the linear case is well defined. It's a single thing, right? It's the only optimum. And then it will converge to that, uh, uh, that solution. Of course, this might take many iterations, not something to maybe do in practice, at least for a fixed data set. But it does make you a lot more sample efficient because for any data, you will find the solution that best fits that data up to now. And especially if you're doing control, this might be quite a valuable trade-off because then you can choose your next action really carefully. And if interaction with the world is expensive, and that's the expensive part of your whole system, then you want to be very careful about which action select. So you might be better off spending lots of compute replaying your data many, many times before you actually choose a new action. Now, using a linear value function, we can actually solve the least square solution directly. And, um, oh, sorry, one thing to point out, let me go back here. I called the data there that curly D, um, which you could think of as a distribution over data, but it's in this case an empirical distribution. It's just a fixed data set. And then I also subscript my expectations with that D, which basically means there's this empirical distribution that I'm sampling from. The expectation is not a true expectation across uh, continuous distribution that might happen. It's just conditioned on the data, for this data. And I'm using that notation here again. Um, and yeah, the expected, when you've converged, this means that your expected update is zero. This basically just means you're, you're there, you're done, nothing happens anymore. That's quite simple to, uh, to reason about. But then we can instantiate that by just thinking about what that means in this case. And then we can find the solution here, 
with some simple algebraic manipulation, which looks a, a great deal like the Monte Carlo solution that I've shown before. If you just think of this v hat right now as using a Monte Carlo return there, the difference is there's no expectations. We're using the actual data. Before, I was talking about where does Monte Carlo converge in the long run, and then there were expectations which were under your current policy. Where would it go? And in this case, we're basically looking at what, for the data you've seen so far, what would be, what would be the least square solution? Now, as, as you will uh, probably know, like, um, there's an inverse matrix here. This is a summation of outer products of your feature vectors, in this case, for the linear case. Let's assume that that thing exists, the inverse. Um, if, you can, if you can compute that, it would be cubic to compute it on the fly right now. But um, if you build this thing up iteratively, which you can do using something that's called the Sherman Morrison um, update, then you can do this in quadratic time. Essentially, this is boils down to the fact that we can add each of these outer products one by one in quadratic time. This is still more expensive than the temporal difference learning algorithm. And um, it really depends on how big your feature vector is, whether this is a good thing to do. If your feature vector is, say, in, in say, the hundreds or the thousands, then this might be quite feasible. If it's in the millions, it becomes quite unwieldy, and you might not prefer to do the, uh, uh, the TD case instead of this. But the nice thing about this is that we can incrementally build up these things, both the inverse matrix and the other part, for each new data, data sample that comes in, and we basically get the batch solution. So we basically get the answer that you would get if you would indefinitely keep on updating on your data set. So you don't have to actually revisit the old data. You don't have to keep on replaying it in the linear case. You could also just update these things immediately and you get the exact same solution. This only applies for the linear case again. So this, this is good to keep in mind. But then it's quite an efficient algorithm. So we don't know the true values. So we have these estimates, v hat, that I had on the previous slide which we can now instantiate in both of these uh, common ways. We could do a Monte Carlo, or we could do TD, and we could solve directly for the fixed point. And we call this least squares Monte Carlo, or least squares temporal difference learning. And one thing that happens is in the off policy case, the cross turns into a check mark for LSTD, least squares temporal difference learning. But there's little dashes there for the nonlinear case, because these things are simply just not defined for the nonlinear case, at least in their vanilla form. Um, yeah, let, let's move on. So now we're going to step away from the linear case. The least squares TD is efficient in terms of data, slightly more computationally expensive, but it doesn't actually scale to nonlinear functions, which you might sometimes need. And the main reason you need them, as I said before, is that sometimes it's really hard to construct good features. And it could be much more efficient and much better not to do that, just to rely on the raw data and to have a function learn its own features, essentially. Or, in other words, to use a nonlinear function of the observations or of your agent state. So many of the ideas that we talked about so far in this whole course, essentially, transfer basically immediately to that case. We just plug in the nonlinear uh, stochastic gradient update for, say, temporal difference learning, and it just works, essentially. Not completely, you have to tune things a little bit, you have to pick appropriate step sizes, you have to do the things you normally have to do in deep learning, construct a good network, find a good optimizer, things like that. But then the ideas, they transfer. So if you do these things carefully, you can get these things to work. So examples of that is temporal difference learning, Monte Carlo, uh, double Q learning transfers, experience replay transfers very well, actually. Some ideas don't. And I list two examples here. Um, there are more, but um, just to make you aware, UCB, which we discussed in the second lecture, is a means to explore very efficiently in uh, multi-armed bandits. You could imagine trying to transfer that algorithm, and people have attempted that, to the sequential case. Um, one easy way to do that is to do the Monte Carlo version, where you just replace rewards with Monte Carlo, and then you do UCB with that. Um, there's other ways you can transfer this to sequential problems. There's something called Monte Carlo Tree Search, um, where you could use ideas like this. But it's not a natural fit for nonlinear function approximation, and the reason is counts. UCB kept track of counts of state visits or state action visits. 
How many times have you selected a certain action? And if you do function approximation, it's actually hard to come up with these counts. And people have attempted this, and there's been some uh, progress on that, actually, to, to basically preempt that to so somehow still learn these counts. But the reason why it's hard is quite intuitive, because what we want is generalization. We want value functions that generalize well. So if you enter a state that you've never seen before, that you get a fairly good estimate of what the value there is. But how uncertain you are about that value depends on how often you've been there, according to the UCB formulation, which means you have to count how often you've seen it. But then learning a count across a state space, you basically don't want to generalize too much. You want, maybe you want to generalize a little bit in as far as these states are similar, but it's very hard to define what it means for them to be similar. And if you do this naively, it turns out not to work that well. And as a similar thing, so maybe you want to be more data efficient. Maybe you want to do something like LSTD. Uh, I'll remind you, LSTD basically solves the, the replay setting where you could do you could think about replaying your experience indefinitely you can get the same solution with lcd but you can get it analytically the analytically part falls apart when you do nonlinear function approximation you can't solve this analytically anymore you don't get the exact solution immediately out of uh, out of the box you can still do it iteratively using experience replay and that turns out to be in practice much more often used efficiently with deep reinforcement learning so here's a concrete example now for what what would that man, that mean so one thing we could do is we could try to do neural queue learning, let's call it. So what does that mean? We'll have a network that maps observations to action values. This is sometimes called an action out network because we'll basically just have a network that has multiple outputs, uh, as many as you have actions. So obviously this only works if you have a discrete action set. Next lecture I'll talk about what you can do when you have a continuous action set. And this function can then just be a deep neural network. And this has been done, for instance, for Atari. Uh, I put observation here. You could also put agent state there. In this case, maybe you could say, let's just consider the case where the observations are your agent states, and these are the same. Uh, we could do an epsilon greedy exploration policy, where these Q values basically immediately turn into a policy with epsilon greedy exploration. So you take the highest Q value, current Q value, with uh, one minus epsilon, and we take a random one with epsilon. And this can then lead to an action. You sample from that policy. Then we define a loss. Um, sorry, I'll use slightly different notation for the stop gradients here. In the previous slides, I used double brackets. Here, I use single brackets. But it's, again, the brackets denote the stop gradient. And it's on the slide, so I'm not that sad about that. Um, so we define a loss. And then we can just take the gradient of that loss, uh, heating the stop gradient, um, which gives us this, um, this gradient which doesn't actually exactly give us the update because you still have to multiply it in with a step size. But instead, what we typically do, we toss this gradient into an optimizer. Say if you do TensorFlow, there's actually predefined optimizers which take a step size as an argument or potential other hyperparameters as arguments. And you could, you could toss this gradient into stochastic gradient descent with a certain step size. Then we get exactly the same thing we had before. There's just alpha times this thing is the update to your weights. But you could also just take this gradient and plug it into RMS prop or plug it into Atom. And that essentially just works. You can just do that. And it, it'll learn, hopefully, if you tune your step sizes. So here's a little bit of pseudocode in TensorFlow. Um, there's some abstraction happening here, right? There's some magic. There's this QNet function that I haven't defined. But you've constructed some network. You toss an observation in. You get an action value. There's another magic function there, epsilon greedy, that takes these action, action values and gives you uh, a sampled action. These things are not hard to implement, but I, they're hidden from the slide. You then index to get your, uh, your action value for the action that you've just selected. Um, hidden from the notation here, this Q there at the top is, of course, for that current observation. So this is like a QS, but not yet for A. And then later on, QA is also for when you select the action. This is the thing that we're going to update. As it says in the comments there, we're going to compute Q of STAT. And we're going to want to update that. So to do that, we take the action, we put it into the environment, we step through the environment, we get a reward, a discount, and a next observation. And because we're doing Q learning, what we'll do is we'll take that next observation, we'll put it through our approximation again over here, where we say uh, QNet of the next observation, and then we do a max on that, which in TensorFlow is called tf.reducemax. This gives us the maximum action value in the next state, and then we can build our target by saying 
rewards plus discount times stop gradient that thing, max q next, and then our temporal difference error, which I have here called delta. Uh, to construct that, you also have to deduct the current action value. This is our error. We're basically comparing this qa, the value of the state, in the, cur the current action in the current state, with this target, which is a one-step q-learning target. And then we can define a loss. In this case, squared loss on the temporal difference error, divided by two. And this is not a residual algorithm because we had this stop gradient on the next state value. So this will implement TD. And then you can just toss this loss into your optimizer. Could be stochastic gradient descent, could be atom, and then it should hopefully learn. Now you could extend this slightly by, by using some tricks that were found to be very useful in deep reinforcement learning. For instance, you could make it more like DQN, which is essentially the same algorithm, but it has these two additional uh, um, components, a replay buffer, so it stores all these transitions, observation, action, reward, next observation, tuples. It stores them somewhere in a buffer. And then instead of updating on the online data that is coming in, DQN samples mini batches from that buffer. This also means that each sample is typically looked at more than once. In a typical DQN implementation, you might look at each transition four times or eight times or something like that. And then the additional uh, novelty of DQN is that there's also a target network, which is typically denoted with, um, it's the same network, but it has a different parameter, which is theta minus. And the idea here is to keep the target that we're going to bootstrap on fixed a little bit more, to make the updates more stationary, more like the supervised case, because we hope that would then improve stability of the algorithm. And it turns out it does. And the way this is constructed is that we just take the parameters that you're updating on each, uh, after each mini batch. And every once so often, say every 10,000 steps or something like that, you would copy them over into the target network, but then you keep them fixed in the interim. And this stabilizes the updates a little bit, and this turned out to be import important for performance back then. Not all current algorithms use that anymore. Um, for some algorithms, it turns out to be important for stability. For other algorithms, it turns out to be less important. It's so not that well understood when you need is when you don't but it's something that can help stability, so it can be useful to try. Which means the loss function is now defined slightly differently because now there's two um, thetas. I still put the stop gradient around the value at the next state, but maybe I didn't even have to anymore because if you think of this thing and then take the gradient with respect to theta, there is actually no gradient with respect to theta minus if you just think of this as an independent uh, thing. Um, just for sy symmetry and clarity, I did put the stop gradient there again, and you could think about theta minus as a function of theta in a slightly contrived way. So maybe it's a little bit safer to think about it this way. Uh, and then we can in, 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 do exactly the same as we did before. We can toss that into an optimizer. We can minimize this loss over time, which is still non-stationary because the target network, network will still change. Your policy will still change. So it still has some of the benefits, uh, sorry, some of the disadvantages of reinforcement learning if you're used to supervised learning. Um, but you can apply this, and it has been successfully applied to uh, things like Atari, where you can basically just take this algorithm, run it, and it can learn these games. Of course, there's a lot of hidden magic now, right? There's some pre-processing that was done, there's some tuning of hyperparameters that is important, a certain discount factor is picked. Um, in Atari, it's typically 0.99, which means you have a certain horizon over which you're trying to act optimally. Um, but given that, there's, this is a fairly simple algorithm that can then be applied to all of these different video games without needing retuning per game, which was the interesting feat there. Um, so there is some generality that was achieved, which is important. The replay and the target networks, which are the additional bits over what you might call maybe a more vanilla neural cue learning uh, algorithm, they essentially, one way to think about it is, is that they make the reinforcement learning setup look a little bit more like supervised learning. The targets are a little bit more stationary. The sampling is a little bit more IID if you sample uniformly random from this replay buffer. And that maybe for those reasons helped stability. It's unclear whether they are vital as it says on the slide and I mentioned already for the target network, but they helped in that case. 
And one way to think about this is this is deep learning aware reinforcement learning. We've changed the update slightly. We've changed the things we're putting into our updates, the data in terms of the replay, but also the actual update targets, the, 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 the algorithm we're applying. We've changed them a little bit to be, to be aware of the function approximation that we're using, and this helps. You could also do the opposite. You could also have reinforcement learning aware deep learning, where maybe you construct a network in such a way that it's well geared to do reinforcement learning, which I won't talk about right now. But it's important to maybe think about these things somewhat holistically, think about the whole system, rather than just trying to plug these things together and hope for the best. But that said, if you do plug them together, you, you can actually make them work. Yeah? Can you explain a little bit more about like why, uh, what's the uh, feature different from uh, the uh, target network from of the, how of the, the original network? Why do we need to separate two uh, different networks in order to stable the uh, so why why does the target network help? Essentially, is the question. Or yeah. So uh, so why do we need them? It's unclear that we do actually. So more recent algorithms sometimes don't use target networks, and they work just as well without, um, depending on what you do. Um, so the the intuition behind it was that it just makes the updates a little bit less non-stationary because if you don't have a target network, each time you update your network the values will change everywhere. And one observation that Vlad, who originally worked on DQN, um, one observation that he had was actually if you make these networks bigger, you increase their capacity, the target network becomes less important. And one reason for that is probably, or at least this is one hypothesis, if you have a fairly small network, then whenever you update a state action pair value, you will basically update many values. There will be a lot of generalization which means you're additionally changing the targets, which means you're tracking something that is moving quite wildly, and this might be hard. If you have a bigger network, you have more capacity, it's as if you're doing coarse, coarse coding or something, but you've made it more fine-grained, which brings it closer to the, to the tabular case, in a sense. Which means that if you update this value that you're trying to update, the target value might not change that much, the value at the next state. Because the network has more capacity, it generalizes maybe less. And that if you generalize less, maybe these target networks become less necessary. Maybe they become less important. So that's one intuition. But the truth is we kind of really don't know exactly why and how they help. But <laughs> yeah, sorry. Do the two networks have the, uh, the same uh, feature vector? Or? Yeah, the, typically what is done is that these networks are exactly the same except for the weights. So the weights in the target network are just an old copy of the weights of your online network. And otherwise, they're exactly the same. So every once in a while, they will be exactly the same uh, network because you've just copied the parameters from your online network into the target network, at which point they're exactly the same. But then you just keep the target network fixed, and the online network keeps updating and keeps changing. And then sometime later, the parameter values are now somewhere else. You just copy it over again, and you, you, you make them the same again. This is just one thing you could do. Not necessarily the best or the only thing, but that's how it was implemented in DQN. Okay, um, so one thing I quickly wanted to touch upon before we do run out of time um, is to unify Monte Carlo and temporal difference uh, learning. And this is important as well when doing function approximation um, for multiple reasons actually. So the, the first one on the slide is that when we bootstrap, updates might um, use old estimates, which means that information in a sense propagates slowly. I'll show you an example of that. This even holds in the tabular case. Um, in Monte Carlo, information uh, progresses, propagates much faster because the first time you see a reward, if you just think of that case, the first time you ever see a reward, in the Monte Carlo case, you might be updating many state values that came before. All of them within the current episode will be updated a little bit towards that reward now, when the episode ends. In the temporal difference learning case, if you do TD with a single step, um, you actually only update this, the value exactly before getting that reward. And the other ones, they were already updated by using the old values, so they don't know about this reward yet. It's only when you return back to a state, and then that one transitions to that state you've just updated, that the information can propagate back further. Maybe let me quickly show you the picture that corresponds to that. This is a trajectory that you've taken on the left-hand side there, where there was some winding path that in the end ended up at the goal. Let's say the agent didn't know where the goal was, so it just did some random stuff. And then 
the action values as updated by one step sarsa will only update the action going up straight into the goal. The action before that, that led to that state, has already been updated using the previous estimates. Now, if instead you would propagate, you would do Monte Carlo, you would propagate the information all the way back to all the actions that you've did. This might also not be fully appropriate because you might be assigning credit for this reward, for this reaching this goal, to actions that actually stepped away. Now, there's an intermediate thing that you could, that you, that you could do, which is end step returns. And one way to depict that is, is this, where temporal difference learning just takes one step, then bootstraps. Monte Carlo takes all the steps until the uh, termination and uses that. But of course, you could do intermediate things where you just take two steps and then you bootstrap. Or you take three and then you bootstrap. And you could do any of those. So you could make this a parameter. And the updates then look like this, where n, n is 1 is on the top, that's just td. So we can now basically augment our notation by putting a little 1 in brackets over the return, which means we're doing a one step return and then we're bootstrapping. And then the infinite step return is equal to Monte Carlo. We can just use this as a target. Everything else stays exactly the same. So it's in between Monte Carlo and temporal difference learning, where we're just picking a certain number of how many steps do we do. And in this example here on the right hand side, this is the update that you get for 10 steps Sarsa, which doesn't propagate the information all the way back to the beginning. But that might also be inappropriate because some of these actions earlier on, they stepped up where they shouldn't have. And maybe you don't want to propagate uh, the information that you have ended up in the goal all the way there because you don't want to encourage these actions. So this gives you a way to go a little bit intermediate and update the recent actions to give them credit for the reward. This is called the credit assignment problem that this is referring to. To give them credit for the reward that you eventually obtained, but to the actions that were too far in the past, you don't give them credit immediately. If then they later on turn out to go to good places, they will still learn, right, as TD did, but they won't immediately get credit for everything. This also makes the update less noisy than for Monte Carlo, Clearly, the least variance you get for TD, and then the most variance you get for Monte Carlo, these things are in between in terms of bias and in terms of variance. This is an example where there's a random walk. You've seen the random walk before. The only difference is now there's 19 states instead of five. The picture depicts five, but just imagine this thing as being bigger with 19 states. And there's a reward of one at one end, and there's a reward of zero at the other end. The policy is just moving randomly, and we're just trying to predict what the value is for each of these states. And then there's this very colorful plot down there. Um, what this shows is, you can basically just look at the left-hand side here. You could look for more detail in the book, um, the Susan and Barto. But what this shows here is essentially for uh, different step sizes, it shows you the curve for the error in your prediction for each of these end steps. So the red line, which is uh, the one over here, is for TD, n is 1. And it shows that you can use a fairly high step size if you do that, because the variance is low. Um, but the best you can do in terms of error for a certain amount of data, this is for the first 10 episodes of do doing this, for a certain amount of data, the best you can do is not brilliant in terms of error. If you use a two-step or a four-step, which are down here, you have to tune your step size appropriately, but then you can get much lower error. So this shows there's some intermediate gain here. If you use two rollers that are too far, those are all the way bunched up at the top there, that's getting close to Monte Carlo again, then you basically have too much variance and you'll suffer from that. So the error will be fairly high again, just because of the variance. Yeah? Sorry, is that prediction error? Or yeah. yeah. This is prediction error. Sorry, yeah. This is not control. This is just prediction error. There isn't even control. The uh, policy is always uniformly random in terms of going left and right. Thanks. So it's almost four, so we have to wrap up. So this is just me stating again that these have the benefits of both temporal difference learning and Monte Carlo. Um, I only have two more slides that you can look at at your leisure. One, I'll actually get back to the next lecture, so don't worry too much about this. I'll actually basically, somewhere in the beginning of the next lecture, s explain this one again. I just wanted to flash it up because it uses multi-step returns. And the other thing is just basically saying there's lots of research here. This is an example of combining many different advances, recent advances in deep reinforcement learning and show that these things can actually all help together.
and we get much faster learning these days than we did uh, only a couple of years ago. So the, re the, the research field is moving quite fast and uh, there's lots of interesting stuff happening, but there's still many unsolved questions as well. And that was basically all I had. So thank you. <laughs>